body shot. Oh, that hurt, didn't it? When the adrenaline starts pumping and you know what you can do with this right hand, it's hard to not do that. Here are your hosts, Derek G and AJ. In a fun night of fights, we had a few split decisions on our hands. A little bit of controversy, maybe, maybe not. Sal Diamato under fire once again. We'll talk about it, folks. In the middleweight division, Sean Strickland, he outpoints Jack Hermanson in what was a pretty clear unanimous decision across the board. But once again, Sal Diamato saw it otherwise, gave the man the split decision. Uh, listen, 100%, 21 votes, 100% of the media members scored it for Strickland and 20 of 21 members scored it uh, 50, 45, 49, 46, or higher, right? Complete blowout? I don't know, man. Here, let me bring in my co-host, AJ, the Santa Fe bomber, the New Mexico native brother. We're talking controversy right off of the bat, you know what I mean? We're talking Sal Diamato, we're talking all of this stuff. But before we talk all that stuff, we do need to do a little bit of highlight because we were wrong, brother. Both of us were wrong big time. The Tough 29 finale, the real one. I mean, listen, Brian Pooh Bear battled. He defended his strap, brother. And I love that he brought the, the, the trophy with him, the whole entire nine. He defended his strap. And what the people would call the real Tough 29 finale against Treshawn Gore. He proved the people wrong. Once again, I told you in the pre-show, I pick against him every time i lose every time i picked against him again and i lost again man i definitely am learning from this one give me your take overall right off of the bat man i mean is he the real deal man he showed up proved the haters wrong and carried that chip on his shoulder like a like a pride belt man he yeah. was he was he showed up man i was very impressed we were wrong and uh honestly uh, the, how he grow from his his last you know the 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 actual finale versus the yeah. real you know what we call the people's finale um showed massive improvement man this Absolutely. dude's for real he's here to stay you could tell the mind was right he's been working he was slimmed down a little bit i think battle's a, a force to be reckoned with coming forward man yeah man i mean best shape of his life but that dog level has he increased the level of dog in him because they was chirping back and forth him and trey sean gore they was going at it i mean my man had the crazy shut eye the whole entire nine uh just give me we'll talk about it obviously the real breakdown and whatnot but overall as a dog have you seen the growth of him you're talking about the skill level but i'm talking strictly the mentality we see it increase a little bit tonight oh yeah man and I, I i love the mentality he had too like i said he kept that chip on his shoulder he was using that as a cookie jar to be that dog and that dog was growing man i like it a lot absolutely and folks i said tonight you know what i mean saturday night all that good stuff man listen uh dan the determined argetta you remember him right aj he was also a tough contestant right he uh he got a main event slot at the lfa 123 main event here this past friday he got a third round tko over uh maron santos man and He's looking to take one step closer back to the UFC. So it's interesting. We got to keep our eye out on the peripherals of these things, right? And the LFAs and all of that good stuff. Because listen, the man, I think he moved over to 7-0 and in his career. He just didn't get the shot because he dropped the ball during the ultimate, uh, the ultimate fighter, excuse me. But I mean, listen, man, the man will probably be in the UFC one day and he'll be coming with a vengeance. Be like, oh, y'all must have forgot, right? Let's definitely take a look, man. But the last little news and note that I wanted to talk about before we got into things and the record recap and all that. The real dark horse of the welterweight division, AJ. Shavka Rachmanov, the man, how many times does he have to do it? 100% finish rate, 15 and 0. I mean, listen, he did the one thing that I thought would make him stand out above all else and prove that he will probably be a champion one day in the future. The man finished Carlston Harris with ease. He made the one dude who I was like, if anybody could beat Rachmanov, it's this dude. He made me look silly and he just starts him in a round, spinning wheel kick, ground and pound. It was nasty. And Harris was able to get to his favorite position, that body lock position, wasn't able to do nothing against Rachmanov. How scary is this man, AJ? do this dude Rachmanov is the real deal we've been saying it for so long and to come out and finish Carlson Harris like that where he didn't even connect flush you know he just needed to tap you a little bit he's got the power of heavyweights the skill of a lightweight this dude moves around this dude is going to be a long time big problem coming forward in the middleweight division man I'm excited it's going to be a great time seeing this dude fight and very calm I yeah. love that he's calm in there calculated focused precise everything bro. it's too awesome. calm it's too calm brother it's like the terminator it's like this dude is just like a robot just walking you down ready to just smash you at any time brother you love to see it obviously you love to see it but folks i will say do not sleep on carlston harris he will be back and i want to make a little bit of a revision uh last show i was saying that he was from guan he's from guyana so you have to represent i mean he's the man of his country right there he's leading the people and just because he took a l versus one of the best prospects one of the best dark horses one of the best contenders right now in the welterweight division doesn't mean that 
that he won't be back. But uh, folks, on the week, um, listen, AJ, I told you this was a bounce back week for me. I needed it bad and I got the job done. Five and one, almost the perfect sweep if I would have learned from my lessons and I would have picked Ryan Battle to win, but it's okay. You still did sharp though, brother. Four and two overall. So I got the win on the head to head. I got a little win on the over and unders by a slim margin as well. Four and two over and under for me, three and three for you, brother. The one miss, we literally had all the same picks. The one miss was that Maximov Soriano fight going the distance. That that was it right there. But how surprising was that, man? Maximov, impressive, right? We'll talk about it in a second. Just give me a brief impression. Ooh, the the tank on Maximov, man, and the and the tenacity and the grit. This dude has some mental power, man. Yeah. He's gonna be a big problem coming forward as well. This is the big problem right here, AJ. The man is 24 years old, brother. That is the thing that we need to take away from here and say. Imagine starting off your UFC career. For a lot of these people, I think DC was talking about it when he was saying, he was like, oh man, I wish I could have started at 21, 22, 23, 24, right? Because DC didn't get into the UFC until he was almost 30. You know what I mean? Because he, he was doing some of the other promotions first. So just imagine how scary this man's going to be once he develops into his body fully and uh, he gets a little bit more of that knowledge under his belt. How, I mean, what's the roof? What's the potential? What's the limit skill and potential wise for Nick Maximov, do you think? Oh man, he he might be able to surpass the Diaz family since he's already trained in there. He has that with that kind of mindset, that mentality, the skill level growing into who he is as a fighter, getting that man strength, that adult strength. Man, we could easily see the the only the only big the big concern you have with that kind of style is he going to be a boring fighter or are people not going to want to watch him so i think that might be the only skill gap because i could see this dude easily running his way up to the top five getting into that contender series grabbing a belt but do the people want to see that kind of fight do we want to see a wrestling style grappling heavy in my opinion he catches a lot less flack than a you know a Derek brunson or, or one of those other wrestling style fighters even a marvin Vittori, because he does have a little bit more hands you know he gets a little bit more but if uh if he doesn't if he just sticks around to that that'll be the kind of ceiling gap what do you think Derek well it's funny that you say that because that's literally the name I was going to bring up I was all like that's kind of in the cloth of the Derek Brunson's but look he's about to get a title shot here even though some people don't want it look how hard he had to work to get it but I do agree with you man as a young fighter establishing yourself yeah, you probably got to be a little more entertaining, a little more exciting. But I mean, listen, right now he's doing the smart thing and saying, you won't be able to, not, to deny me if I just continue to win. And that's really the game plan right now. I mean, Nate Diaz was impressed. He liked what he saw. He was corner side over there um, during the fight. So hopefully this is just the evolution of a Nick Maximov. Take the easy wins, take the gritty wins. I'm not going to say it was an easy win against Soriano, but take the gritty wins and then let's step it up over time. Either way, folks, on the year so far, I am nine and 12, a little under 500. So next week, Probably going to pick that back up. Hopefully that's the case. AJ, 14 and 7. Seven fights over 500, brother. So listen, man, hot start for you on the year. I'm slowly but surely making my way back. But overall, as a program, man, we are there. You Like I said, man, rough couple of weeks doesn't determine the year. Let's get it, brother. Um, AJ, man, let's do a little bit of photo collection, brother. Why don't we? So let's jump straight into it, man. And like, I got to jump straight to it, man. Brian Battle with the trophy, the whole entire nine. You'd love to see it. I loved, I love that he had it on him. Like, I, I wonder, did he bring it? I didn't see the walkout. So I was like, did he bring it on the walkout and like place it down? It was like, all right, when I win, I'm pulling this back up. If Gore won, was he going to take the trophy and give it to Gore and be like, all right, brother, you the champ, whatever the case may be. It was a little touch and go for a second, brother, but just, uh, uh, give me a uh, give me a uh, overall just feeling of this photo right here man i love the fact that he brought it with him because that that shows ultimate confidence you knew you're going in there you went in this fight you know you, you he had his mental game going which i love and if if he did lose that would have been cool to also see him give it to trey sean gore i had the exact same question yeah. like would he have manned up and did it like yo dog i did bring this i was gonna rub it in your face but mm -hmm. since you beat me here you go that would have been cool to see as well you could tell it actually means a lot to him too man to fight through what he did this is a, a feel-good moment right here seeing that and even michael bisman was like oh wow <laughs> <laughs> yeah absolutely absolutely brother and we move on to the next one right here um brother you corrected you corrected you picked correctly excuse me you definitely picked very correctly when it came down to the fight of the night and that's a segment that we do at the end of our shows on the preview show every single week folks so if you don't tune into it you could potentially miss out on the one fight that you should be tuning into on the main card on the prelims whatever we do sleepers but when we say fight of the night that's action-packed guaranteed and there was a little bad blood between these two going into the fight but overall there's a picture it's squashed they settled it and that's the look of two dudes who fought their asses off who all they can do is just dap each other up like bro that was was a great scrap now the bad side Stephen Peterson missed weight so Julian Arosa double bonuses on the fight of the night hundred thousand dollars brother give me your take on the photo 
Man, this is a this is a moment. If you've ever been there, where, where you've had a crazy big scrap, you know, and you you had some bad blood with the person, but there's nothing but respect after because both you showed up like men and handled your business. This is that exact moment where you're like, "Fuck it, man, we're homies now." This is cool. Sucks for uh, sucks for Peterson, cause and, and really and good for Barossa and that he got that double bonus. But man, that is that is rough because uh, even at the way show or at the pre show and the weigh ins, he's saying, "How can you beat me if you can't beat yourself on the?" Wayans, very good, very correct statement. Rough for Peterson, but a hell of a scrap, man. That was a lot of fun to watch. Back and forth, bloody as could ever be. And then you see how it ends with the handshake and the gratitude. I love that. I mean, yeah, absolutely, brother. If you can't beat the the, the scale, he ain't going to beat me. But he came close. And remember what I said. I said, if there's one man that can do it, it's Steven Peterson. The man came close, brother. So you don't count these dudes out. Um, all right, man. Now, this is going to be a little bit of a, of a warning content before I put up this next photo, folks. If you don't like seeing snatched limbs and broken things and dislocated things, uh, probably skip ahead a little bit. But if you're a fan of those things, let's check it out, man. Dennis Bondar, man. And in the UFC debut, look at that arm, folks. And I'm going to just like you know move around it with the mouse if you don't mind look at that arm that's that's not looking how it's supposed to be looking right there and that is due to malcolm gordon but i don't like i don't know they gave him the technical submission victory right there but i don't think it was his submission that broke the arm or dislocated the arm i think it was like he had posted his arm and the weight collapsed over it it was nasty, but I have another complimentary photo to go with it right here, AJ, and where you can kind of see it a little better. And it looks like it's just a dislocation. It doesn't look like a break to me personally. Um, so, you know, listen, man, I went to school for health science. I studied, I studied cadavers all day long, touching hearts and insides of people, you know, bones and all that. This doesn't freak me out, but it must not feel good. You know what I mean? What do, what, what do you make of this situation? Man, the only reason this freaks me out a lot is because your elbow is so hard to dislocate. Yeah. Like it's in such a, a, a protected <laughs> joint, you know, and going that direction of a dislocation. I'm actually hoping, uh, shout out Dr. Brian Suter. I hope he does a video on this one because I love seeing those, man. This is a, a hell of a way to go. And I, I, yeah, right. I don't think it was his elbow that actually did it. But man, that was uh, not necessarily rough to watch, but you know, he must be feeling it after. Yeah, absolutely. But just give me your take real fast on the circumstance, right? This is a Bondar who has had all of these complications trying to make his UFC debut, all of this time off, time away. And then it's just a nasty break. And I mean, pardon my phrase, it's not really the right phrase to use, but you know what I mean? Just when I say a break in terms of like bad luck, like you get in here, you make your debut. And it wasn't even really a fight yet, man. Like we didn't really get to see the fight. We saw a little bit in the first round and arm popped and that was it, man. So overall, as a circumstance, I mean, you got to feel for Bondar, am I right? Oh yeah, no, you well, you feel bad for him, but the 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 shitty part is, man, that's life. You know, yeah. sometimes when she, when when it goes down, it goes down, and nothing you can do from it. This might be one of those spots where Bondar comes back better than before, because yeah. you're right, he didn't necessarily get the best shot, had the hardest opportunities. You know, everything was stacked against him, and then he dislocates his elbow like. 45 seconds into the first round i mean you, know, you feel horrible for the man but i'm hoping he comes back because this dude is a killer man if anybody has the mental fortitude to come back from something like this it's a bondar this dude's a, this psycho is a great nickname for him because he's very mentally powerful yeah absolutely brother so move on to the next one right here um and this was just the name of the game right here maximoff scooping up punaheli soriano like i was saying earlier um this was literally the game plan for all 15 minutes is scoop him up put him on his back use your jujitsu use your wrestling grind it out non-stop pressure and take away the number one offense for a big time striker like Soriano which is just staying on the feet trying to box him I mean smart plan brother just give me a take on the photo you want to nullify the power get to those hips get those hands locked and dump him on his butt that's the that's the name of the game and maximum proves steady you can see he's in deep over there too and when he's on that double leg there's nothing really uh soon uh, puna could do so try to hold on to the fence and not not get taken down that's all you could do right there brother i mean it's tough when you especially when you want to fight and you just keep getting taken down taken down taken down it's a frustrating thing um, but next up, this next photo right here, this is the newest man who stormed onto the middleweight scene. Talk about a UFC debut. This is very akin to the Terrence McKinney uh, UFC debut when he knocked out <clears throat> Matt Frivola, <clears throat> excuse me, folks, when he knocked out Matt Frivola in what, 15 seconds, 16 seconds, 17 seconds? Chitty and Joquani gets a 16 second KO over Mark andre Berriolt. Impressive fashion, literally, one, two. That's it. Textbook. Classic. 10-inch reach advantage. Got the job done. And we saw a very similar uh, thing happen 
and I don't have a photo for it, so I apologize, folks, but Philip Rowe did the same thing to Jason Witt, just like, what, one fight earlier, two fights earlier? It was literally the same thing. It was just a right cross down the pipe, 10-inch reach advantage by both of those fighters, but the point for Chitty and Joe Kwani right here is, like we said, David versus Goliath, small gym versus big gym. I mean, he made it look easy, brother. Give me your take on the photo. Derek, you called it, bro. This was a hell of a sleeper fight. Folks, if you if you didn't catch this fight and you want to hear what it sounds like when a melon gets popped, bro, go listen to how that right hand impacts. It is a thud like none other. Chitty Njuquani is the real deal, man. I had a, I had I had homies texting me saying, like, damn, like this, this was one hell of a fight. Chitty and Jaquani is the real deal. I hope they uh they pick up on his nickname. They weren't throwing that second chitty in there for the chitty chitty bang bang. So <laughs> I hope this dude starts to really come up, man, and gets a grind. He's a he's a fun fighter. He's a very, very entertaining fighter. We saw the nasty kicks, the teeps, just as soon as it started coming out. And didn't really get and he did the, the smart thing. He didn't give Mark Andre Barriot a chance to get going. Because the man's nickname is Power Bar for a reason. He just powers up as the fight goes on. And uh listen, Chitty got the job done. Uh, for this photo right here, brother, this was a complete victory this was a total complete victory one of the best of his career Hakeem Dawadu mean Hakeem got the win over Mike Drizano and AJ I just got to say before I ask you to comment on the photo and this photo folks for those who are just listening this is Hakeem Dawadu landing a clean left hook all day on Mike Trezano as he's just walking in but the thing that I had a problem with is that Mike Trezano he didn't use his wrestling until the end of the fight when it was too late he stand to just basically kickbox with Hakeem Dawadu which is basically the worst thing that you could possibly do because how has everybody who has got a win over Dawadu got the job done you mix in some wrestling you know what I mean you take him away you get him off balance all that however Dawadu has noted he was pretty much healthy for this fight and I don't want to use excuses or any of that stuff but he has said he's been dealing with some spinal cord injuries herniated discs things of that nature you know atrophy of the arm all that good stuff so he came in he was healthy he landed a career high in total strikes in terms of 141 listen brother it was a beautiful performance he's looking jacked look at the six pack on the man as he's throwing that left hook it's looking incredible give me your take on this photo Man, clean left cross, catching uh, Trezano with his hands down. And, and like you said, he was coming in healthy, which is good to see. I saw a tweet that uh, that Hakeem put out where he was taking this fight like a do or die, which I yeah. love that mentality going in there. Clean left hook, looking ripped. It's a, it's a beautiful photo. Yeah, absolutely. And I don't know how much stock you want to put into these things when fighters are emotional, especially right after they just got into a fist fight. But he did say <laughs> if he lost the fight, he was definitely considering retiring, which is a surprising thing to hear from such a talented fighter like Hakeem Dawudu. Like we were saying, it's not like he's ever on these down slopes. It's like he's rising, rising, stalls out, rising, rising, stalls. But it's never like a downhill slope or anything like that. So you would hate to have something like that happen to such a talented fighter. Um, next up, AJ, this is a photo right here where I just wanted to say this is the game plan. You got somebody like a, Ju uh, a Yulia Stoliarenko who wants to do nothing but get you in her guard and armbar you. Alexis Davis was deep in an armbar early in that fight, brother, but she used her wrestling. She did what everybody thought she was going to do and just pummeled uh, Stoliarenko, ground and pound. We're going to talk about Alexis Davis a little bit later, AJ. This is an important fighter, so don't, don't forget this. But I wanted your opinion on this is somebody who had no fear, who jumped into the guard of Stoliarenko, said, my wrestling is better than your grappling. Like I said, was deep in the armbar, escaped, but got the dub. Give me your take on the photo. Deep in the armbar a couple times, Derek. That uh, uh, Julie just Sto Soliranko was throwing up that armbar like a, a mad woman, a woman possessed. But this, what's what I like about this photo is this is the spot in the position where both fighters think they're about to have the advantage. Yeah. You got Alexis Davis on top, ready to start the pummel. You got Soliranko throwing the guard up. It's 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 right where both fighters think. Oh, this is where I want to be. This is the spot. And then it just depends on from there where, where we saw Alexis Davis run away with it. But I like this because you can literally see the hips up. Stoli Aranko is looking for it. She's grabbing onto the wrist, about to turn. And uh, Alexis Davis coming in for the pummel. I mean, this is this is a, a, like a, a picture-perfect start of where both fighters, where the chess match starts to begin. Absolutely. And you got to take note of the knee sleeves on an Alexis Davis, who you don't know if there was a knee injury going into the fight or if she was just planning on doing a lot of wrestling. I mean... In her last fight, she didn't have the knee sleeves, and it's something like Nganu-esque where if you do have a knee injury, you're putting sleeves on both knees. You're not just putting them on one. You're not letting the people know, oh, yeah, this knee is the bum knee. But uh, I do want to say, AJ, put a little respect on my girl, Yulia Stoliarenko's name, brother. You know what I mean? That she, I know it's weird to spell for us Americans, but Yulia Stoliarenko right there, brother. Um, all right. AJ, this was just... 
I mean, this is Rachmanov. We talked about him earlier, but look at that flush right hand with the ground and pound put Carlston Harris out. Like I said, that's the scariness of a Shabkat Rachmanov. And folks who are listening, this is the ground and pound photo of Rachmanov just literally smashing Harris's face into the ground. Um, this is the scariest part is that everything, there's no load up on anything. Everything comes flush, you know what I mean? Just straight from the pipe, has incredible power on it. But even look at his face. like you can, His face is a little blocked by a shoulder here, but it looks like he's almost emotionless while he fights right there's no emotion there's no reaction when he wins it's like ah all right what's next <laughs> you know what i mean it's like it's nothing too crazy man it's like you love to see it but give me your take on the photo brother man this uh like you said Derek, calm cool composed and deadly man uh rachmanov is the real deal what's rough for harris is there's uh or carlston harris there's a uh, nowhere to go really man your your shoulders are on the ground your head's getting turned this is a, a rough spot to be in but i love how locked in rachmanov is on this man you can still see him calm and cool expression but he just focused in right on the target Lands a beautiful, beautiful right shot on the ground, right ground and pound. And he's in deep on it too, man. He's lunging in, throwing full power. Great photo. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, all right, main event right here. This is Sean Strickland at the end of the fight. I think he's just screaming at Hermanson. He was he didn't start talking until 10 seconds left in the fight, but when he did start talking, it was entertaining. He's yelling at him, let's go, Jack, you know, all that good stuff, man. Um, I mean, they stood in the pocket and traded for all of 10 seconds, but the rest of the fight was a very surgical pinpoint technical boxing match between the two. You know, there was no wrestling. Hermanson couldn't get in on the shot. We'll talk about that in a second, but the madman that is Sean Strickland continues to rise, brother. I believe undefeated. 20 and 0 in the middleweight division man it's a beautiful thing to see give me your take on the photo man this is uh I, this is what we were expecting a crazy sean strickland coming in i'm glad we finally saw a lot of it i hope we see more of it strickland was saying how he was kind of not going in there no, no disrespect to her man, but he was going in there like this was a, a low-key sparring match so i hope next time he doesn't let the pressure get in because we want to see more of this we want to see more of that bloody sean strickland screaming and going crazy i think that's his mo going for the future and if he keeps that up it'll be a uh, stacking you know stacking more and more likes his way absolutely and folks who are a little uh confused by that statement of uh you know he, he was looking at this, underlooking Hermanson. We'll extrapolate on that in just a second when we do the actual breakdown on that, folks. But the last photo right here, man, this is Strickland holding up Hermanson's hand. You know, Hermanson's looking at Strickland like, what the fuck are you doing right now, bro? Put my hand down. But he puts his hand up and he says, this dude's a warrior. Nobody after a loss wants another fighter to do that to them. I'll just say that. You know what I mean? It's very embarrassing. It's just like the same where uh, Figueredo, I think, when he beat... Uh, I don't remember who he beat, but he beat somebody for the championship and whatnot, and he picked him up. I think it might have been like Alex Perez or something, but he picked him up, lifted him up, all that good stuff, and he was just like, bro, you're like adding insult to injury there. Just dap him up, respect, and leave it. What do you make of these situations, AJ? Like, if you were in that, if you were in the other shoes, if you were Hermanson, and you lost a very one-sided 50-45, 49-46 decision loss, do you want your opponent to put your hand up and tell you that you are a warrior like that, or are you rather just, you know what I mean, take it on the chin and keep it moving? No, nah, man, I'm taking that on the chin and keep it moving. Don't you dare put, grab my hand and put it up, man. Yeah, no, I uh, I was actually, I'm glad you brought this up because I was going to ask you the same thing. I feel like it, it's not disrespectful, but it's also disrespectful. It's, it's like that backhanded compliment you're going to get. Like, yeah. this dude was good. He almost beat me. Like, you know, just say that, bro. Yeah, we everybody stop, man. Fuck you. Like, yeah. leave me alone. Yeah, this is. Uh, I don't know, man. If I would, if I was in there, I guess I would have just grabbed Sean Strickland's hand and put it up. Like, yeah. like he's the real winner. You know, maybe that's the way you can save face. But I always laugh whenever a fighter does this because it's meant out of a show of respect, but it's very disrespectful. Yeah, in all honesty, like the the mat respect code, in my opinion, man, you win with honor, you lose with honor. I mean, you win, bow, shake the hand, walk away. That's it. You lose, bow, shake the hand, walk away. It's, it's the same thing. There's no difference here. Um, either way, man, uh, this was a very, very fun night of fights. That is the photo collection that I got for you folks. So um, what I'm going to do is move us back on over here, brother, and we can proceed with things. But before we jump into a rankings review or anything like that, folks, you already know what time it is. Drop a like, subscribe, all of the fun stuff. We're Once again, we're like 335 subscribers on our youtube channel so let's get that up a little bit maybe move over to 340 345 350 why not man we on our surge to about 400 500 by the end of the year it'll be a beautiful thing if we can get that we can grow the show more people can get to see some of our sleeper picks some of those uh picks that we go against the grain that get the job done like nick maximov this week if you're listening to my picks folks i mean five and one on the main card i slipped up on the gore pick but 
overall, man, that's not bad. If you're not going for the parlay, if you're going individual picks, that's the one. If you're looking for that big uh, plus, the the minus 105, minus 115 for Chitty and Joe Kwani, you should have listened to the show. So, you know, once again, AJ's over here. Last week, this man was killing it. The week before, I mean, even this week. Listen, overall, you bet our picks. You're making you some green, you know what I'm saying? So drop a like, subscribe, share the show, and uh, you can find everything at bloodywaterpodcast.com. Enough said. All right, AJ, let's jump into a little bit of a rankings review, brother, you know? And today we need to talk about somebody who um, I feel like you're probably not going to expect. Most people wouldn't expect me to be talking about this fighter right now, but I told you that she was important and I told you that for a reason, brother. So let's jump into our rankings really fast, brother. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to scroll on over to the women's bantamweight division, brother, and let's just take a look at what we are looking at. So folks, right here, once again, if you are listening right now, folks, this is an Excel spreadsheet or a Google Sheets, whatever the case may be, but this is AJ and mine. These are our personal rankings for the UFC's women bantamweight division, and on the very far left corner we have the ufc's consensus rankings right so at 15 aj i have jessica rose clark you have julia avila both really really good picks to be slotted in at number 15 or in that number 15 to number 13 mix right there for our personal rankings however the UFC has Norma Dumont at number 15 in the women's bantamweight division, somebody who primarily fights at women's featherweight, right? And I think that because the state of the women's bantamweight division is so slim, it's it's that slim pickings right there. You know what I mean? You just got to have a placeholder, have somebody there. But my question to you is, how do we feel about Alexis Davis right now, brother? Let's take a look at her tapology sheet. So Alexis Davis right now, she is considered to be on tap on tapology, excuse me, the number 16th ranked female bantamweight fighter in the world right now and when we look at her uh record overall i mean it's it's a little spotty but this is the the argument that i wanted to make with you right here so she gets the win over yulia stoliarenko nice she drops the ball against panny keon zod and let's take a, be- a look back at the rankings panny keon zod in the ufc's rankings is number 12 right for me i have her at number 10 and for you the disrespect brother you don't even have her in your rankings how dare you but that no, i got goes- 13 do you? Okay. Yeah, you do. All right. Apologies. See, folks, this is why I got to catch myself. I might have to snap over here. You know what I'm saying? Because Pandy <laughs> Kianzad is the real deal. Either way. Um, all right. We go back to Alexis Davis. So she drops the ball to what we would consider a top 10 to top 15 fighter, a legit fighter right there, right? She gets the win over Sabina Mazo. That was an upset pick. A lot of people didn't expect her to win that. Sabina Mazo is a very talented prospect. She loses to Viviani Araujo, Araujo excuse me. And let's take a look there because she's a top contender too. Viviani, do I have her in my rankings? No, nobody? No, we don't have her in her rankings. It's okay, Not but she's a, top, she's a top fighter. Would you agree with me? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Viviani Araujo is amazing, man. Okay. Jennifer Amaya just challenged for a title, just fought Caitlin Chukagian, right? That's like that top five of the division right there. She loses to her. She loses to Caitlin Chukagian, who is a perennial top two fighter in that uh, women's uh, bantamweight division, right? Or not bantamweight division, the flyweight division for uh, uh, Caitlin Chukagian. So let's take a look at where that fight takes place. It took place at flyweight. And at flyweight for Jennifer Maya, for Araujo, at Araujo flyweight. So this is a recent move up to bantamweight right here. Because that loss to Panny Keon Zod was the bantamweight. So she went from flyweight to bantamweight, right? So this is even more of the argument. She has a couple of wins now at uh, women's bantamweight. She has one loss at the women's bantamweight. And a lot of her losses and recent success and wins have come from the women's flyweight division. So given how shallow the entire division in the, in, for the women is, shouldn't Alexis Davis take that 15 spot? Like, that's the argument that I'm trying to make here. She has the skill to beat a lot of these top 10, top 10 to 15 fighters, in my opinion, because look at what she's able to do. Come in. Yes, is her striking a little bit left to be desired? Of course. But she has that big right hand. But what's most important is she can get you on your butt and keep you there over the course of 15 minutes and win a gritty grinder dog fight of a fight you know what i'm saying so what is your argument for a yes or a no first off yes or no i need that answer do you believe that she is a top 15 fighter in the women's bantamweight division oh 100 percent, man 100 percent uh, uh she um uh, she's amazing man like 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 yeah. you said the little bit left to be desired in the striking but what i like about her is the grit and the tenacity the 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 way she goes about her stuff and very confident in her abilities because she knew she was going to be working for the ground and pound the entire time that's really what it is <clears throat> excuse me and i definitely think instead of norma dumont we should be putting her right in, into that 15 because she's found a home in that bantamweight division man alexis davis has struggled in the flyway but now found her home in the bantamweight division and two and one is isn't that bad, especially considering how everyone else fights in the women's division yeah. to really 
really up and down start. You can you can get a title shot after you know going five hundred. Like it's yeah. it's pretty wild. But uh, Alexis Davis is very very strong coming up, moving up that weight class. She's kind of found her power, found her skill, and very dominant on the ground. I definitely think she's one of those ones that's being slept on because I agree, Derek. In that top ten, top fifteen area, she definitely belongs. Uh, and moving forward, I think she's got to get a little bit more respect in the, to that name. Once the UFC kind of sees what's going on, I hope they bump her up into that so we can see some more top tier fights she's fought some crazy you were you were breaking down the whole list man you go Caitlin Chikagian Viviane Arujo all the, all these fighters those are top top tier fighters and we could see Alexis Davis in there smashing it'd be good to see absolutely so the question becomes though right here brother in terms of our rankings right I got Jessica Rose Clark at 15 Carol Hosa at 14 Julia Avila at 13 Misha Tate at 12 and I know I'm a little, I mean, both of us have Misha Tate at 12. We're probably a little low on Misha Tate, even though, I mean, a lot of her storming up the rankings was of what she did in the past as opposed to what she's doing now. Either way, who would you take out of your rankings right now to give Alexis Davis that slot? Because I don't know if I feel comfortable taking Jessica Rose Clark out. I don't know if I feel comfortable. The only person I would feel comfortable taking out right now, and it's only due to inactivity, is Sarah McMahon. That's the only person. She just hasn't fought in a while, brother. But is there anybody else? Maybe Alina Landsberg, honestly, um, because, like, when's the last time she's fought, right? But those are, like, the only two people that I would feel comfortable taking out of the rankings um, right now currently. What do you think? Yeah, man, that's uh, it's funny because that's exactly what I was thinking too. I was like, who, where would I go? Because I like I like Avila at that you know that ten to or that twelve to fifteen area. Carol Hosa is amazing. Penny Kianzad, like you said, Misha Tate. Yeah, I, I have her low because of where she. Sure, you know she's you know ha had all the success in the past, but where she is now, it, it's it's I don't feel good bumping her up to ten. But that Sarah McMahon, that Lena Landsberg. They're great. They're crazy good fighters. So I feel hard to take them out. But due to inactivity, that's probably where I would go yeah. if I had to. Um, probably more Sarah McMahon than Lena Landsberg. But <clears throat> even at that point, like it's yeah. still you're 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 uh, what's the word pulling hairs or, or you, you know you're yeah, you're, yeah, yeah. yeah you know what I'm talking about yeah. No, I hear you. You know what I mean? This is, but we're being, you know, nitpicky right here. You know what I'm saying? Like, it, when it comes down to it, these are all really, really good fighters, but somebody got to go. And I think Alexis Davis deserved to be in the top 15, folks. So that is the 60 seconds rankings review right there, folks. You got to make do for some of these fighters, even in the divisions that you don't really care about. You know, not the most notable, not the most recognizable. But at the end of the day, Juliana Pena is the new champ of the division. Hopefully, we get a little bit of a shakeup. Let's see what happens with that rematch. We're going to talk about the announcement, right? I guess I'll just let the cat out of the bag right now. Tough. 30. It's going to be Juliana Pena versus Amanda Nunez. So, you know, it's going to be some build up for this next fight. But either way, Alexis Davis, man. I mean, listen, let me just look at the age really quickly. Alexis Davis right now, 37 years old, looking like a prime 37 year old, ready to kill the game right there, brother. So, all right, that is the rankings review. Once again, folks, let's move on to Fighter of the Night. All right, brother, this is the fighter of the night right here. And I was hard pressed to single this one down to just one fighter, to be honest with you. You know what I mean? I was looking, I was like, there's so many people I can go. So many people had very impressive performances. Um, you know, we were talking about Julian Arosa versus Steven Peterson. I mean, Julian Arosa had a hell of a performance at the end, screaming, he was hyping himself up, hitting him with the left hook, like talking about, let's go, yeah, you know, hyping himself up back into the fight, you know, willing himself into the fight. That was beautiful. Brian Battle had the incredible performance. I mean, Chitty and in, in, uh, Jaquan. We already talked about that one right there. I mean, let's talk about for a second. Um, you know what I mean? We had, uh, listen, I mean, we just had so many good fighters, man. You had, uh, listen, uh, why am I blanking on the name? Jailton, Jailton Almeida, you know what I mean? He just completely smashed Danilo Marquez. And that's something that even though he was a huge betting favorite, like 100% finish rate or something close to that. I mean, listen, Marquez is absolutely no slouch. And then you also got Nick Maximoff, so many fighters. AJ, I want you to go first, if you do not mind. Give me your fighter of the night. Who had the intangibles, the storyline, everything that blent into one to not give a fight of the night? We already got that. That was a Rosa versus Peterson. But to give us something unique to this program, and that is fighter of the night. Who you got, brother? Man, you're right, Derek. There was so many to choose from. You got Malcolm Gordon. You got Phil Rowe. They had amazing fights. Everybody, you've talked about it. The Chidi and Jaquani had the amazing uh, debut performance. It's, there was so many to choose from. But honestly, Derek, I, I, I'm going with the guy who I doubted. You know, I, 
I love, <clears throat> excuse me, folks. I love when I get proven wrong because it means there's still room to grow. And I think that this fighter has the same kind of tenacity and mindset where he's like, oh, y'all think I'm out? Like, y'all y'all got some beef? All right, what's up? Let's, this is where it is. And that for that reason, man, I am going with Brian Battle as my fighter of the night, bro. He came up. Everybody doubted this man. I doubted this man and showed up when it counted, talking some shit, talking some smack. They were chirping back and forth losing a little bit you know he, he had a good first round and then he gets rocked it's kind of going down on the battle but what i loved and why i chose brian battle as my fighter of the night you know you had all the intangibles from the ufc show being picked last being doubted being you know where where the, the other coaches are saying oh you should have done your research on who you picked everybody the media everybody thinking this dude is out for the battle you know he's not easy no pun there but out out you know under respected and nobody thought he had a chance, and he was holding all that in, man. He was he was on his Goggin shit where he's saying, like, oh, you got some doubters? Cool, man. This is that uh, mental fortitude, that callousing of the mind that says, oh, yeah, you know, we got, like, you got, y'all are down with me? I'll show you who's real. I'm going to show up. I'm going to prove it. I'm going to put the proof in the pudding and smash on people. I love that, man. He changed all the haters' minds. He brought the, you know, we talked about earlier, he brought the trophy with him, full confidence mode saying, yeah, I am the winner. And what I like, too, is he even called everybody out at the end, too. You know, he he, he didn't let it, he didn't let them slide, man. He let them know that there was a grudge out there and saying, oh, y'all, I heard you coaches saying you should have done your research on who you picked. Yeah, you, you didn't pick me. You didn't do your research. I love that, man. Calling people out on their bullshit and then sitting there fighting and actually a good scrap, too. I mean, Treshawn Gore has some serious power and battle stood there with the best of them, showing that fight IQ. Man, I loved it. And everybody thought, like I said, everybody thought he was going to get knocked out. He handled the storm very, very well, called the people out, rubbed it in their face. All, the whole thing all the way from you. What's nice is you can go all the way back to the Ultimate Fighter show and how this dude came up was always the underdog, a little chubby, nicknames Pooh Bear. Everybody's talking shit about him, but he comes up, shows him who's the real dog in there, and I love it, man. And for all those reasons, Brian Battle, that's why you're my fighter of the night. You proved, you proved me wrong, brother. You proved me wrong. You proved a lot of people wrong, and I'm happy you did it because it was an amazing performance, man. What you think, Derek? Well, listen, brother, that was beautiful. That was a testament right there, man. I mean, Brian Battle got to make a clip it out one but you know what i mean play that one back a couple times because listen i mean he's the people's champ right there in terms of tough right now he, he is the true and the people's champ in terms of uh, the ultimate fighter but um listen my fighter of the night is going to be someone who i just talked about brother and listen fighter of the night is subjective right but it was who impressed me the most who stood out to me and said oh my god i can't believe this is happening there's so many good fighters i don't want to slight anybody but i have to go back to alexis davis and there's a reason for that brother on paper people said okay what did she open up as a a minus 220 favorite. Oh, she's supposed to win. Brother, Alexis Davis, man, let me single myself up. Alexis Davis was, first off, easy game plan. Let's get the trip. Let's go in. Let's ground and pound. Let's do all the good stuff. Let's wrestle. We already talked about that. But how deep that Julia, uh, Yulia, excuse me, Stolia Renko was on that arm bar on multiple occasions and with the commentators yelling, oh yeah, that's a broken arm. That arm is about to snap. Her arm must be really flexible. I hope it is. Normally you see somebody get deep in an arm bar and then they can't use that arm anymore because their arm is, you know what I mean, handicapped now. At that point, they're fighting with one arm. Alexis Davis gritted through all of that nastiness to be able to go on, continue the ground and pound only to get illegally up kicked just moments later after being deep in that arm bar and what happens when the referee when the doctor is asking if they're okay all that good stuff she's talking like it's any other day they're asking a question she's like pardon me excuse me oh oh yeah can you fight yeah, yeah, yeah of course i can fight listen there wasn't even a a moment of of doubt in her mind where she thought damn, I could take the easy way out. I could Diego Sanchez this right now, you know what I mean, and pick up that easy win. She's 37 years old, gets up kicked straight into your nose. And folks, I don't know if you've ever been up kicked or if you've been like hit when you're not expecting to be hit and you're not bracing for it and it's on your nose. I mean, that's like the worst combination you could possibly have right there. That's not Aljermaine Jermaine Sterling-esque where you catch a knee when you're not expecting it. And that's like a real serious blow. But somebody who's literally kicking you, they're donkey kicking you from the ground into your nose you eat that like a boss you go say i'm good let's go scrap i know i'm 37 but i'm gonna go beat the shit out of this girl who's trying to arm bar me all day long you go back into the guard you play her game you win you show you're dominant you're the wrestler you're 37 years old and you're not to be reckoned with stop counting this person out yes she was a betting favorite over there but most people look at alexis davis and they probably say oh yeah give me the arm bar girl she's gonna get submission da -da 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 -da. you know what i mean alexis davis she continues to prove the doubters wrong cont continues to 
prove the, the casuals wrong, I guess I could say, because if you're a hardcore, if you know about this sport, if you watched her fight, you know how good she is. That's why I'm over here uh, petitioning for her to be in these top 15s right here. That's why I'm petitioning for her to get some respect on her name. So AJ, I know yours has some more steam on it. Brian Battle, that was a very fun one. He really proved the doubters wrong. But I think Alexis Davis deserves a lot of credit for doing what some would call the unwise thing, which is to not even flinch and be like, yeah, whatever, illegal upkick, schmeagle upkick, I'm going out, I'm winning. She's my fighter of the night, brother. Said and said, through and through. But I wanted your opinion, AJ. Was this an honorable move by Alexis Davis or was this a very unwise move for her to just keep it pushing after she ate that upkick? Man, most honorable. Like, I, I think she doesn't get enough credit for doing what she did because she ate it. She ate it right right on the nose. Like, it was a very powerful upkick. Um, I definitely think the, the ref should have taken a point because <laughs> it, it wasn't – it might have been – phased as accidental but you threw that up kick pretty hard and everybody knew she was on the ground i think there needs to be a little bit more repercussion because it shouldn't be on the fighter to have that mentality of i'm gonna quit you know i you, you called out the homie diego sanchez which is a little rough there <laughs> but having that that mindset is uh it's it's sad to see when you can see the fighters think oh i can i can win this way like oh you start you know going doing all the stuff acting I think uh, Alexis Davis, yeah, Alexis <laughs> Davis did the uh, the honorable thing, yeah. the right thing. She knew she could fight. She knew she was scrappy, and that mentality proved strong. I love the pick. Absolutely, absolutely. So I was a little unorthodox. Like I said, there was other really good fighters. Like I said, the Nick Maximov, Julian Arosas, uh, Chitty and Jaquanis, all of these fighters, man. Even Sean Strickland himself, even though he was technical, man. It was beautiful defense on his end. But Alexis Davis, that's my fighter of the night, folks. And with all of that being said... Have you seen that replay, buddy? Let's see. Your head was bouncing around like a pinball machine. Time for some main card breakdown. Courtesy of your hosts, Derek G and AJ. All right, brother. It's time for the main card, right? We've been doing all of this talk about all of these other fights, but let's get straight into it, man. Julian Arosa gets the split decision win over Steven Peterson. At the end of the first round, if you would have told me to predict the future, I would have said Peterson was about to be out minutes going into the second round. However, the man picked up his steam. The more he got hit, the tougher he got, man. And that's something that Arosa was saying himself. He said that he was like, I don't know what it was about this man because I thought I had him finished at the end of the first, but he just got stronger and stronger as the fight went. Very impressive performance overall. That right hand was money all day for Steven Peterson, but Julian Arosa just had a little more of a dog in him and he was able to secure a couple tape takedowns, which really, I mean, at the end of the day that's what one hit for him however he moves to five and five in the ufc and believe it or not aj this is his first decision win since 2017 when he fought jamal emmers so give me your take overall on the fight brother what'd you think man this was a dog fight i told you folks this is going to be fight of the night and i honestly i was with you i thought julian rosa had peterson out i thought he was out man but this was a very back and forth battle where uh, I I had a I did have it going to Arosa, so I'm glad the right guy won in that in that fight. But this this was a scrap, bro. This was something you're gonna see. I'm a little bit surprised that both of these dudes chin held up. Like both of them were getting rocked. You saw at the end in that picture that Derek put up at the beginning. Both people were bloodied, battered. This was uh this was a crazy fight, and I think Pearson needed to tap into that uh that superpower that he has. Where you're right, the more he got touched up, the more he got hit, the stronger and the better he started fighting. That could be a very like a will breaking power that you can have where somebody just keeps cracking you and you just get stronger and stronger start start hitting harder if you would have tapped into that you know maybe this was a five round fight we just saw a different outcome you know but this was a great fight man i was i was hyped up that this did live up to the the hype that i was putting on it because i thought this was going to be a scrap from the beginning and i'm glad we got it to see a dog fight because that's julian rose's mo man that oh, yeah. that that scrappy mentality where he could stay with it continuously that's what i love seeing from julian juicy j arosa what do you think about the fight Derek? well i thought that steven peterson did one thing that a lot of people aren't giving him credit for and he willed julian arosa into a dogfight he willed him into that one for one i cracked you now you crack me now i crack you that was the, like if arosa could have kept it clean could have kept it technical didn't get too wild kept his hands up a little higher right i think we would have saw a different outcome but as soon as he started getting touched up man it's like all of that went out the window and like i said in the pre-show one thing he noted was that he was like whether i win or lose i don't like to go to the distance so it's like you could see you could see that man arosa was getting rocked all day left and right but peterson was too man it was a very very fun fight over Overall. But if you would have saw Steven Peterson's reaction at the end of the fight, you would have saw that he was kind of pissed off. He thought that he won the fight. What argument can you make for Steven Peterson winning this fight? 
Oh, man. I, probably the fact that he was in there still applying pressure, too. He wasn't backing up. He wasn't stepping. You know, he, he kept his foot in the tire, swinging, like you said, punch for punch with Julian Arosa. The fact that he was able to do that. Ah, man, I like to see the numbers on points or on, on, on striking and everything because I feel like Arosa did more of the damage. Peterson probably landed more efficiently. Um Right. But I, it's it's hard too because I I had a score for for Arosa, but I did give Peterson a round, so I thought it was a very close. I can see where the split decision comes in. This is this isn't one of those egregious ones where everyone's looking around. I think Peterson does have an argument that he got he he could have won it if things went just a little bit differently. Um, it's a little too small for me on my screen to read it, so I'm gonna have to have you do it, Derek, on those numbers. All but right, if, if anything, it must have been the significant strikes or the power for it. Right there, there we go. Yep, yep. Uh, total strikes landed a little bit more. Significant strikes landed a little bit less. I mean, more takedowns. So I can see where Peterson comes from, where he's going with the uh, significant strike. He has a significant strike percentage more, yeah. uh, as well as a total strike. So he did more. He had more output. Arosa might have had more control, more time. But I definitely think that's where Peterson think, thought he won. He thought he did more. Ironically, I feel like the damage level, you, usually I can say like, oh, this guy did more damage. But I feel like both fighters did all, all the damage, man. They were both cracking, so it's hard. No, absolutely, man. And that's that's the thing is, like I said, when we were looking at it, I mean, what it really comes down to is when we look on a per-round basis, right, we're going to see that Julian Arosa, uh, he outstruck Steven Peterson in the first round by slim margin. Peterson outstruck him by slim margin in the second round. And uh, Peterson got outstruck in the third round, ultimately, man. But it was it was a very back-and-forth fight, man. I think that Steven Peterson, in terms of the damage, like in terms of rocking Arosa, um, he, you know, could have edged out a couple of rounds, maybe. But that's the thing is you don't have a statistic for, like, how many times did this person get rocked. If you knocked him down, that's one thing. If you rock him, I mean, it's hard to statistically put you know what i'm saying like it's hard to put that either way man this was a very very fun fight for uh overall between arosa and peterson arosa got the job done this was a nice one man a little bit of a step back for steven peterson so it's tough because um you basically you cheat yourself out of a bonus right you know you miss the weight you don't get the bonus and you lose so you get half of your pay that's that's a rough one for steven peterson man but he's fighting over there out of fortis mma and you know there's going to be good things in the future for steven peterson um all right aj Treshawn Gore finally gets a headshot, man. He drops the ball against Brian Battle, and uh, as impressive as a win as this was for Brian Battle, you know what I mean? He defended his, his strap, all of that. You know, we already talked about that earlier. The Tough 29 champion defends his Tough 29 trophy. Treshawn Gore, brother, the story of this fight was you got to let it go. You got to just let go and just handle business. And easier said than done. I'll just say that. Easier said than done. But that's going to be the crippling aspect to his career if he can't let his hands go more. The power is devastating. You have to wonder. This is the question because Bisping was talking about it too. Is it a gas tank thing? Like, is he just like, does he have a, a shallow gas tank? He's not willing to let go because he doesn't want to get tired. He looked really tired at the end of that third round having to do some wrestling and all that. But it seemed like the whole time he would press Brian Battle up against the fence. And the reason he lost is because Battle was constantly calf kick, teep kick, calf kick, one, two, jab, calf kick. And Gore would just eat it, eat it, eat it, eat it, eat it. One big shot. And that's it. One and done. You can't be one and done and win these fights, brother. Give me your assessment. Yeah, it's hard. I don't I don't know if it's a gas tank issue, man. He's a wrestler. Uh, Treshawn Gore has wrestling. He has the chops to get it done. Very in shape, very talented. I honestly think it's a mental issue, man. I was saying this in the in the pre-show we were talking about it when the mics were cold that it, it's just I think it's a mental issue where he's thinking too much. You know, he's he's waiting for that perfect opportunity and it doesn't always present itself and sometimes you have to make that opportunity for yourself. Do the Xs and Os in order to see one of the hands drop and then land that big bomb that you got. But it's it's just hard cuz sometimes when you're in there, you know that. You know you you know you got to set your strikes up, you got to you know set the traps, plan the traps and then attack when they do present themselves. But then the more you let those hands fly, the more holes open up for you and you can get caught. You can get put out, especially with a very talented striker and a very talented fighter, excuse me, like uh, Brian Battle. I don't know, man. It's hard because that you you have to you have to risk it to get the biscuit, like the saying goes. But when you do that and you're in the cage, nobody wants to get knocked down. Nobody wants to get punched in the face. It's just how it is. You know, you want to you want to do the beating. You don't want to get beat up. So I think it's a, a big hurdle 
that uh, Trishon Gore is going to have to get over of that fact of, man, I got to get on the inside. I got to, I got to let the hands go. I got to work that power so that I can land that big shot. Cause I don't, I don't, I don't, I hope it's not a gas tank issue. If that, if that is, I guess that's a little easier to solve for Trishon Gore, you know, do a little bit more cardio, get a little bit more rounds in the gym and, and grow that confidence in yourself. Cause the mental challenge is probably the hardest one to get over when you're thinking the entire time. And that's, that's really what I think Trishon Gore does a little bit too much is think worry. Yeah. Uh, worry is probably a better word. Or worry about the things, or worry that's not going to set it up. Think about it and not necessarily execute. What do you yeah, think? yeah. I mean, the last thing you you need to be doing in there is doubting your capabilities while you're there. You know what I mean? You just got to let go and let the risk. You know, let the dominoes fall where they will, or let the cards fall. Whatever the saying is. AJ, brother, I wanted to ask you: Did you think this was a close fight, in your opinion? Yeah, uh, I had it as a close fight until the third. Because yeah. really, Brian, the very close fight in the beginning, when he got when Brian Battle got rocked in the second round, I thought it was over. I thought this dude was going to be putting him out. And then he started running away with it. He came back. He got a little bit more greedy and came back. I had it as a close fight, even going into the third, because I thought Battle won the first one. Yeah. But then he just ran away with it at the end. Brother, would it be surprising to you if I told you, on paper, uh, Brian Battle outstruck Treshawn Gore by 55 strikes? Significant. 55? 55, brother. It was 112 significant strikes in favor of battle, 57 in favor of Treshawn Gore. Um, no doc, no knockdowns for either. One takedown, one of eight for Brian Battle for takedowns, two of three for Treshawn Gore. So Treshawn Gore got a couple more takedowns, really didn't do anything with it. But Brian Battle, it was all volume. And that was I knew that going into it. This was power versus volume. I just didn't expect Gore to be so gun shy. That was really the thing that I think surprised probably everybody. But is that surprising to you? The the amount that battle outstruck Gore. Uh, now that you say it, like like if you if you would have told me that stat at the beginning, mm -hmm. I wouldn't have been as surprised. I'd been like, yeah, Brian, that's Brian Battle's mo. But now after seeing the fight, yeah, hundred percent because there's. That, he was just super gun shy, man. It's crazy. Yeah, man. So, I mean, hopefully we can see a improved Treshawn Gore in the future where he just lets go a little bit more. Because, I mean, listen, man, there's no disrespect here. We both think he's an incredibly talented fighter. I think everybody does, which is the reason why he was a betting favorite going in this against the champ. You know what I mean? The tough 29 champ. However, Brian Battle, he he just went to show, man. Like, he's in shape. He's as game as ever. He's a better fighter than he was when he fought Gilbert Urbina in the tough 29 uh, finale. And this is... <clears throat> excuse me this is gonna be a scary man in terms of just like opposition and we'll talk matchmaking a little bit later and i got somebody fun that i want to see him matched up with so big win for brian battle all right aj right here nobody was really too surprised by the outcome of this necessarily um i think a lot of people expected a finish i expected this one i believe to go the distance i picked the over on this one so i was wrong just because sam alvey is so tough but brendan allen man comes in four days notice becomes the third man to submit sam alvey in his mma career his illustrious mma career only the sixth man to finish sam alvey overall in his career and uh he did it in two rounds brother but he didn't do it the way that i expected because he decided to do the one thing that I thought he shouldn't do, which was just stand and trade with Sam Alvey and play Sam Alvey's game. And Sam Alvey, I mean, listen, he was looking sharp. That left cross was looking mean. I mean, listen, first, tell me the tell me what your assessment was and how impressed you were for Brendan Allen. But next, we have to talk about Sam Alvey, of course. But uh, let's talk Brendan Allen first, man. Big performance in the light heavyweight division. Is this a grappler who's fallen in love with his hands right here, AJ? Uh, I, I, I don't think so. I, I'm not, I'm not ready to say he's falling in love with his hands and he's going to be a striker from now on. I feel like he's saw the way that people like to see fights happen and taken a little bit more, a, a step in that direction, not necessarily falling in love because he does have the ground skills, but he sees where the money is and he sees how, you know, things get going. And with a fighter like Sam Alvey that, throws so much but can get cracked and can get uh, wobbled then that presents an opening for the takedowns and the submissions i think that's a little bit more of a game plan strategy than necessarily brendan allen falling in love with his hands i definitely think he has the ballsy move like <laughs> ballsy move going against sam alvey for power especially because Sam Alley has that that um, that uh, Woodley style where he'll he'll back up against the fence and then just throw bombs. And if he catches you, it's it's a it's a hell of a crack. We even saw Brandon Allen a couple times get 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 rocked pretty good, but he still stayed true. But he still stayed with it, stayed in there, kept the pressure up. Very impressive for Brandon Allen. Like I like you said, Derek, I I did not expect that at all. I was expecting him to be shooting like crazy wrestling match providing that pressure but you know brendan allen held true and he, he actually showed some pretty good power too man he rocked sam alvey pretty good until he got that choke and 
I mean, all credit to Sam Alvey. You you got to be able to put this dude out. Nobody can – like, it's very rare that his – he'll get wobbled, but getting the absolutely cracked KO knockout, not going to happen. Not too often anyway. Uh, but all credit to Brandon Allen because he stuck with it with a very ballsy game plan. All credit to all in Brendan Allen, man. Obviously, this was a light heavyweight bout. He's going to be back at middleweight division, all that good stuff. This was originally slated as a middleweight bout, but, uh, you know, short notice. You know, uh, that's what happens. Um, listen, brother, this is Sam Alvey's seventh straight loss. Yes, he's a company man. Yes, he's fighting whoever, whenever. Yes, this was probably the sixth or seventh straight opponent change when he was scheduled to fight somebody specifically. Does he stick around after this one, brother? It's like at this point, this was a tweet that I saw. They're like, man, people are like the commentators even. They're running out of excuses for Sam Alvey, brother. It's like you, at a certain point, it's like, do you still got it? And he's fighting the cream of the crop. Don't get me wrong. It's not like he's fighting bums over here. He's fighting the cream of the crop. But what, what, what are we doing with Sam Alvey if you're the UFC? I think, uh, unfortunately, we're moving him either to the first fight of the main card mm -hmm. or we're starting to see a, pre a prelim Sam Alvey. I mean, I don't think he gets cut. I, this is rough because he did. And oh, first off, too, I got to say, man, we got to put some respect. Y'all got to put some respect <laughs> on Brandon Allen's name because we're doing oh, yeah. it over here, of Derek course. and I. He's ranked like number, I forget what it was on Tapology, like 70-some, yeah. where other fighters he's beat are like 30. And it's, like, it's crazy, man. For uh, Side note by that. Yeah. But, but anyway, Sam <laughs> Alvi, he's he's been like you said, Derek, fighting the cream of the crop. It's hard because this dude is, is he's older, he's very talented, he has such a good like a resume that you don't really want to put him against you know the up and comers because yeah. but that's that's kind of where he's he's fallen in line and until he really starts getting some wins against those people and solidifies himself as kind of that gatekeeper position, uh, it's it's unfortunate. I I don't want to see him retire. I don't want to see him go out like that. I do want to see him do what's what's good for him. If that is retire, if that's keep fighting, whatever it is. But I would like to see that that kind of style stick around where oh, yeah. you're down to trade. You're down to go one for one. You're, you don't mind being put to get your back against the fence because you're going to sp spring out and attack. It's just he needs he needs some wins, man. I think prelim yeah. Sam Alvey might be the best way to go. Yeah, man, I hear you. And uh, a quick little aside for that side note that you put on right there. So Brendan Allen, you see how I have number 16 for those who are watching for Brendan Allen, right? When I was on Tapology doing the rankings, um, he was originally slated 16 going into this bout. I check it after the fight and then he's number 34. So I'm just like, how, what are we doing here? How could he possibly be number 34 in the middleweight division? How? You know what I mean? It doesn't make sense to me. But either way, either way, I do agree with you. Um, Sam Alvey, brother, you know what I mean? Listen, he's a very, he's a fun fighter, man. And he shows that he still got it. It's not like this dude's washed. Like, it's not like he's like Chuck Liddell, barely able to, you know what I mean? Looking like a shell of himself. Like, he's still looking sharp. Left hand is still looking, looking, uh, you know what I mean? Nasty, looking mean, big power. But there's only so many losses you could rack up before you can justifiably be like, all right, brother you got to either get on the prelims and then this is your last shot or we got to move you to a different promotion i think he could have some success in bellator to be honest with you brother I, th I think he really could he has that that fu power that'll just push you out you know what i'm saying so big win by brendan allen a lot of people expected this he was the biggest betting favorite by the time the fight closed or the betting odds closed i think it was like a minus 435 favorite biggest favorite on the card so big big win that's all i got to say on that one all right, AJ. Rachmanov, TKO, round one, gets the big win over Carlston Harris. Um, to me, I don't know if, it, if you felt the same way, but it felt like Carlston Harris came out and he had some jitters. You know what I mean? He was a little too too active, doing too much. When he was swinging, he was swinging for the fences. And Rachmanov, with that very efficient style, fighting out of Kazakhstan, was just chilling, waiting. Do, do, do. Step back. We're here. No emotion. Straight shots spinning wheel kick out of nowhere that you could tell surprised Harris you know what I mean he gets rocked a little bit and then he jumps on his opportunity and gets the job done AJ we talked earlier about how scary of a man Rachmanov is um, but I just wanted to put this into perspective folks because if you don't necessarily put this into, into perspective you won't know how impressive this is overall right so what I'm going to do AJ is I'm just going to go back to the topology page and we're going to look at Shavkat Rachmanov and look at the the damage that the man has done over the course of his career the man is 15 and 0 right so let me zoom out a little bit. The man is 15 and 0, right? And when we scroll down here, let me take this out the way. Carlson Harris, he gets the, the KO right here. Brother, every single fight, 100% finish rate, rear naked choke, guillotine choke, win on first round punches, second round punches, second round corner stoppage, third round punches, second round triangle, second round rear naked choke. Everything is a finish. It does not matter, brother. And it's ridiculous because he did a lot of his damage in M1. And M1 Global is a fight. I mean, Fedor was doing it, representing M1 for a long time. These are some of the best international fighters, a lot of Russian fighters. These are some of the best guys that you can find, right? He comes over to the UFC and there's not a 
single problem, man. The two chokes, one knockout. The man is versatile. He can do it all. But that's the craziest thing to me. Um, so right now, the man, I mean, listen, 6'1", 77-inch reach, born in Uzbekistan, fighting out of Kazakhstan. I mean, he doesn't have the personality, to be honest with you, because even in that post-fight pressure, I was like, that's rough, brother. Like, when they're trying to interview him, I was like, this is rough. This is, we, the people don't want to see this. Come on, brother. Even Bisping was sitting there, and you could tell the whole time. He was like, I'm trying to be done with this. Like, I'm not trying to be interviewing this guy. But if you take the personality and the entertainment aside, this is the dude who nobody's going to want to be the champion who's going to be the champion unless he can learn how to talk like Habib a little bit. But I don't understand or see how anybody can put a dent or slow the man down, given his current fighting style, man. He's too efficient, you know what I mean? And you could kind of tell over the course of three rounds, I think he'd be able to do this all three rounds, no problem. He doesn't have a very high energy um, in terms of like an energy consumption type thing in terms of his fight style, man. How impressive, brother? What are we talking about? Just give me, is there anybody who could beat this man right now? If we threw him in the top 15, he could probably get some dubs. I don't know. What do you think? Ooh, man, we threw him in the top 15. He could easily get some dubs. That top 10, that top five, that's where it starts, the questions start to happen. But even that, he could still get some dubs up there, man. Shavkat Rachmanov is the real deal. Like you said, I, I rough for the entertainment perspective, but I think that leads to why he's such a good fighter because he's sitting there, he's calculating, he's thinking he's very calm. And when you're calm and you know your heart, you don't get your heart racing, the blood doesn't really start flowing, you can be more precise, more tactical, more deadly. And that's exactly what Shavkar Rachmanov does, man. Very his his interview style is just like how he fights, very calm, very dangerous. But like I, I it's it's rough because I honestly wish, and this is I don't know. It could, it could go either way with this, but I wish the translators of the fighters would do a little bit better job of helping them out promote a little bit more. Because you know, like as you know, as as a translator speaking both languages, you know what he wants to say, and you know what people want to hear as well. I wish they would do a better, a bit better of a job. Even uh, even uh, Michael Bisping commented saying he's like that at the end. He's like that was an interesting. I forget I forget the quote that he said about the interview, but he definitely had some remarks about it as well, even about the translator. So I wish he get a little help there. But that's about that's about all he needs. That's about all Shavkat Rachmanov needs is a little bit of help in the translation and the promotion. Other than that, when with the X's and O's and the hands and the fists, this dude is the real deal. Like you said, gonna be the champ. Maybe nobody wants to see it. I definitely do. I want to see him fight some some real deal contenders and i think it's about that time for him as well man what you think i mean i'd have to agree with you right there brother i mean translators got to do a little bit of a better job i'm trying to remember the dude's name who he's uh i mean he, it's he he was with uh devison figueredo man Va walid or something like that man where he, it was another fighter i don't remember who he was but walid a former fighter himself he basically was taking over and he was talking a gang of shit right and he was doing it for his fighter but his fighter wasn't even saying those things it was more of him just being like nah that's what we're gonna do right so it's a fine line you don't want to step too far but at the same time show give your fighter a little bit of help right here brother the man doesn't speak english we gotta we got to make him um you know popular in terms of the everyday mind the household name in the american audience so it's unfortunate that you have to play that game especially when the international this is an international game man i think there's only like two american champions in the ufc right now but the big point is i mean come on shabkat rachmanov a force to be reckoned with i don't necessarily understand if if and or how people could be sleep on this man right now, I mean, you could sit there and be like, oh, I don't know who he is because I only watch McGregor and da 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 right? However, if you watch and you know anything about the welterweight division right now, you know this man is slowly but surely, it's like a ticking time bomb who is just waiting to get into that top 15 and start smashing people. So big win for Shavkat Rachmanov. Didn't think he could do it, especially in the first round. Um, you know what I mean? I thought he was going to win, obviously, but I didn't think he can get a finish in the first round. But uh, yeah, this is a uh, unstoppable force right there. At least it seems like it. Okay, AJ, if we had to do this fight 10 times, Punahele Soriano versus Nick Maximov. Uh, Maximov won. He won via split decision. I, th I didn't think it was a split. I thought it should have been unanimous. Personally, personally, we'll go to the MMA decisions if we want to sit there and we want to, you know what I mean, uh, uh, you know, pick hairs or whatever the case may be. But AJ, brother, this fight happens 10 times. How many times does Maximov win? I think like seven or eight. I think with that style of him getting it done like that, I think he runs away with it almost every single time. Maybe he gets clipped with the power of Puna. Maybe Puna, if if he was able to defend a little bit better, just a little bit, I think that that flexibility that Puna had is really a double-edged sword. And I honestly think that's where he hurt himself, doing those splits. Everybody was impressed when, I, when he was doing it, but I was thinking, I was like, man, you're leaving one leg in there very, very, <clears throat> excuse me, 
in a very dangerous situation. And I think eight out of 10 times, man, Nick Maximov is going to be that pressure wrestler, that ground and pound, where he's going to keep getting it going, always looking for that. And that gas tank is never going to fail. Part of that Diaz army, that death by a thousand punches, that's what Maximov's going for. But he's a really good wrestler as well. Unfortunately for Puna, unless he's able to defend those takedowns better, kind of how we saw Strickland versus Hermanson, where you defend him so well that their opponent doesn't want to shoot anymore, I think that's the only way that really we'd see Maximov kind of do that. But at the same point, Maximov is very headstrong. He's going to keep to the game plan. And that's a very high, hard task to, to kind of impose on somebody of them kind of breaking their will and not wanting them to go. So I think it's about 8 out of 10. What about you, Derek? How many times are you thinking? I'd have to agree somewhere around there. I'd probably say like seven out of ten for sure, just because that Soriano power. If he just clipped, if if he clipped him one time the wrong way, or if Maximov stayed deep in that shot while Puna was just smashing down on him and didn't move his head, like Maximov was very strategic. He would put his head next to Soriano's ankle, so Soriano would literally couldn't punch. He would he would punch himself if he tried to punch Maximov's head. So it was very impressive, just how like. I told you, like, Maximov is a very intelligent fighter, man. He's very smart and cerebral in there. It's not just like, oh, I'm just going to do whatever. I'm just going to grab it. No, he's very intelligent in there. So um, I just think the thing that's that's um, handicapping Soriano right now is his reliance on the power. Even the the fighters, were, it's kind of like Ngannou. It's like if you could just learn to, like, lighten up your shots and start throwing some jabs, you know what I mean? Just, like, use the power when you need to, but let's go a little more technical. Like Deontay Wilder, for an example. It's like if you could teach the man how to box – like legitimately technically box he's the scariest man in the world you know what i mean just because that power is ridiculous so it's just like let's work the jabs let's work a couple light shots let's not put 100 percent into everything and then when he's ready let's drop the bomb on him right however listen he's gonna learn he's still relatively young man he's on the uh the bright side of under 30 right now i think he's like 28 or 29 and there's a a, a high ceiling for puna heli soriano in the ufc i believe however aj you talked how uh, i asked you do you agree split unanimous whatever you gave me kind of the uh, you know let's talk about the mma decisions real fast so right here brother it goes to show michael bell doug crosby and ron mccarthy they all scored it um you know what i mean so it was 28 29 that was the split decision for michael bell in favor of soriano 30 27 for crosby i don't agree with that one and 29 28 for ron mccarthy in favor of uh, nick maximoff which i do agree with aj but when we move down here it goes to show that 12 of 16 media scores scored it in favor of maximoff um only four you know what i mean for soriano so i think that the people believe that uh nick maximov got the job done i don't know what verdict is looking like personally but either way man i mean what can you say you can't really argue with that what do you think i i see a little a little disagreement a little discontentment in your face what do you think I, my brother? i'm just always blown away like because like i the the 30 27 is ridiculous like, yeah. i i don't know who like i definitely agree with that i think it was with Cros whoever was the last judge i forgot the name of it Ron McCarthy. Um, Ron McCarthy, that the 29 28 is where it should have been for Maximov. I had Puna winning, what was it? Round one? That's the one. That uh, I yeah, had. round one. So I had Puna win, winning round one, Maximov winning the rest, the, the rest of them, you know, getting away. Uh, but he was bloodied up. So I, I just don't see how you do 30 27 or score it for Soriano. Like, I'm always blown away. And I, I, I just always want to want to know what these guys are scoring for. Like, what, what fight were you watching where you're getting those numbers where you think Puna won this fight? Because he was grimacing, he was hurting, he was always on the back. Yeah, he was landing some big body shots, but it was shots of desperation, not shots of, you know, like uh, intent or uh, uh, there's probably a better word for that. But you know what I mean? Well, so when we look at the numbers, I can understand on paper why people would say, oh, no, how did how did Maximov win that fight? When we look at the numbers, we have uh, uh, Soriano outstruck Maximov 45 to 29. However, the big takeaway from here, brother, is that Nick Maximov tied the middleweight record with 11 takedowns in the fight. 11 of 16, 68 percent on the takedowns. No takedowns for Puna Heli Soriano. You know, this is definitely when next time that we talk about Soriano and we talk about his takedown defense, this is going to take that percentage way down. But that's the, really the key, man. Yeah, he didn't strike him much. 11 takedowns. Can you argue with that? I feel like you can't really even argue with that. Yeah. I, unless uh, they have some different scoring in Bellator, so maybe over there. Yeah. But 11 takedowns. And Puna, Puna's a great wrestler as well, man. He, he uh, I forget if it was a Juco or actual wrestling, but this dude, uh, he has some very high credentials. So in order to get 11 takedowns on a guy, man. I mean, folks, if you've never done it, go out and just wrestle with your buddy yeah. and try to not, like, try take somebody down 11 times, even – you know, however your skill levels match up, it's a very hard thing to do, especially when these guys are so talented. 
but I mean, very impressive either way. Yeah, brother. I mean, at the end of the day, Puna Heli Soriano came in here as a state champion in wrestling and a, uh, a judoka, you know what I'm saying? State, state champion judoka. So it's like the man had the chops, but Maximov, is it surprising to you that he said, yeah, I was expecting a little bit more. You know what I mean? He was like, I just trained with killers all day long. I was just expecting a little bit more from this big behemoth that was Soriano. Did that surprise you at all? Uh, a little bit, to be honest. I mean, because hey, that's uh, that means that Maximov is getting those that work in, man. Yeah. If he's saying that, where because he was genuinely surprised, like he was like genuinely expecting Max. a little bit more, <laughs> and uh, that's that's crazy. Yeah, brother. I mean, that's training over there at the Nick Diaz Academy. You know what I mean? And he put on for two hundred nine, put on for Stockton the whole nine. So shout out to the Central Valley. You know, that's my that's where I grew up at, not in Stockton, but in the two hundred nine, Modesto, California. Um, so shout out to them, man. I'm glad that they're making a little bit of resurgence. The two hundred nine cannot live and die with the Diaz brothers. I'm glad Maximov is putting on for him. Big win for Nick Maximov. Punaheli Soriano will definitely be back. Do not sleep on the man. Please do not. This is two losses in a row, but you know, you're going to learn from that. He was previously undefeated prior to that, brother. So you know what I mean? All right, AJ. Now the main event. Now this is not the main event that the people wanted, right? On paper, like it was like, okay, this should be a fun matchup. When you saw it, I was like, this is a snoozer, brother. I love it. It was very technical. Like it was for me, I enjoyed the technical back and forth. The ability for Sean Strickland to just sit there, engage, use his jab all day long, basically win the fight on jab and be able to just teddy atlas said it best like strickland just is like this this far away and folks who are just listening i'm just putting up just my two fingers together like he's this far away from jack hermanson's jab every time he's just right out of range boop boop right out of range like he's not getting hit like that you know what i'm saying and let's prove it because at least that's how it seemed to me but if we look at it okay if we look at it, I guess that it doesn't really agree. You know what I'm saying? So the stats say that Jack Hermanson landed 137 significant strikes on Sean Strickland, which is, I mean, that's a lot of strikes if you think about it. It didn't feel that way when we watched the fight. Sean Strickland's nose was a little bloody, but that's the name of the game. Anybody's nose is going to be a little bit bloody. Hermanson's face was a little more beat up, but Strickland landed five, 153 for 330, and Hermanson actually outstruck. I mean, like out, he threw more strikes. Than, uh, than Sean Strickland, which is surprising. I don't know. Sometimes I look at these stats, and I'm just like, huh, it doesn't feel like the fight that I just watched. But what do you think about this? I think those numbers are uh, a, a little bit skewed because they're counting in leg shots, kicks, sure, and kind sure. of that kind of stuff. Because that's where Hermanson was a lot busier. He was yeah. throwing those leg kicks, throwing those you know stuff to the body, and he was throwing a lot more. But I agree with you and Teddy. Teddy they they had it. Or he, you guys, we have it correct where he's saying he was just out of range. He was literally pulling back just enough to miss, but still stay in a spot where where uh, Sean Strickland could attack, where he could he could hit him, but not be hit. That's the ultimate goal. It's just the problem is when you're throwing when you know when your opponent's throwing a bunch of leg kicks, calf yeah. kicks, and stuff that you're checking, they still count it as a strike, even though you're checking it, even, even though you're checking. defending it. Like it's it's they don't count it as a parody, you know. So it's yeah. it's it's a weird that these numbers can get a little bit skewed. But I think you know I agree with you. You're you're right right there. I mean, let's look at the landed by target. Sixteen percent, only sixteen percent to the head for Jack Hermanson. Eighty-one percent to the head for Sean Strickland. Thirty-seven percent to the legs for Hermanson. Only two percent to the legs for Sean Strickland. So it's interesting. And when we're looking at in terms of like each round, Sean Strickland outstruck Jack Hermanson in what? three of the five rounds you know what i mean so it looks like in round one and round two in round and in round five round three and round four went to jack hermanson in terms of the ability to uh to outstrike him i i believe it seems that way actually no sean strickland actually outstruck him in every single round i don't know why the bars are, sh are showing it that way either way he outstruck him in every single round when you show it so it's like 20 uh or actually okay i'm taking this back folks these bars i don't know what it's doing to me they need to just give numbers not bars but it looks like first round went to hermanson 26 to 22 second round was tied 32 to 32 third round was to strickland 27 to 26 fourth round to strickland 34 to 27 and fifth round to strickland 38 to 26 so rant over the point is sean strickland he he cruised he clearly cruised to an, a point victory against hermanson anybody who saw that going for hermanson i don't know what to tell you you know what i mean we knew he had one shot at really winning this fight definitively and that's grabbing the takedown he couldn't get that done when we look at the takedown attempts uh, o of eight for Jack Hermanson on Sean Strickland. And this is something that I noted on the pre-show, right, AJ? I said, Court McGee, one of the best grapplers to do it, could not take Sean Strickland down when they fought. And this was not as improved of a fighter as Sean Strickland is now, right? That was like a while ago. So for Jack Hermanson, really good grappler, not a great wrestler, really good grappler. Couldn't get the job done, man. So, I mean, Jack Hermanson, we do know he's a very formidable opponent. We do know that he gets a lot of respect in the middleweight division. But my question to you is uh, how big of a win is that 
in the eyes of like a Sean Strickland fan or just somebody evaluating the career of Sean Strickland? Because I kind of feel like the win over Uriah Hall was a little more impressive personally. A, a little more impressive. Honest, honestly, this was a very impressive fight for the technical ability of Sean Strickland. One of the most impressive things that I saw from this one is he's, he's, he sees the shots coming. A lot of the times, folks, you've ever done it where you're in there, you're, you know, you're striking, you're battling, you get clipped with something you didn't see, you, you don't know where it came from. You, you know, Usually you get hit with that one again. Sean Strickland gets caught with this beautiful looping left hook of Jack Hermanson, gets caught on the chin one time. Every single time after that, literally, he'd throw up the parry blocking it every single time anytime jack romanson threw that left hook boom parried it away from him very impressive and cerebral like like sean strickland saw that get caught once and was like oh okay like that's what you like that's the one you're gonna hit me with okay boom block it every single time super impressive the unfortunate thing though was it an impressive victory overall wasn't it wasn't a fun fight a big you know a, a crowd pleaser not necessarily but for a technical striker it was a very it was this is one of those like um Ah, uh, man, I can see his face. The, um, uh, damn, Stephen Thompson. Thank you, there Stephen Thompson. Uh, where a <laughs> very welcome. point-esque fight where you're, uh, you know, you're, you're doing what you're supposed to do, but it's not that fun, unfortunately. Yeah. So it's maybe not a big win because I agree with you. I think the Uriah Hall win was a lot bigger. It was a lot more entertaining, and that's kind of the fighter we want to see. But from a technical aspect, seeing what Sean Strickland was doing and how he was doing it, very impressive one. Yeah, absolutely. At the end of the day, he criticized his own performance. He says, I fought like a pansy. You know what I mean? He's like, I didn't bring it. I kind of cruised. It was like a sparring match to me. And I let the suits get in my head because he said, why risk getting knocked out when I could potentially get a title shot next? So um, he's in that line, maybe not next, but maybe the fight after next. He is indefinitely there. You know what I mean? Especially if any injury happens to the winner of uh, Cannoneer versus Brunson, you know, Strickland's stepping in right there. But that's the thing, man. You know what I mean? When you're thinking right in his head, in the back of his head, he's all like, bro, I could have a title shot let's stay safe let's play it safe but he criticized himself and he says he learned from it and he's not going to fight that way anymore we'll see if that's the case either way this was a really big win by sean strickland the in and out style of jack hermance and that irky jerky you know it could work against a lot of guys i think sean strickland he has the best defense in the middleweight division statistically we're not just saying that like statistically in the history of the middleweight division he gets hit the least and i know these stats don't necessarily prove that getting hit 137 times but i think we're more talking about like those head strikes the elusiveness i mean like i said jack hermance and lands 137 significant strikes only 16 percent to the head so it goes to show how hard it is to hit sean strickland flush in his face little bloody nose not too bad big win for sean strickland still undefeated in the middleweight division and brother that is the main card recap right there man so it was fun like i said a fun night of fights we only unfortunately had two finishes three split decisions and one regular decision so it was, it was interesting night of fights overall but uh if you like the segment folks drop a like subscribe uh hit us up on uh you know instagram bloody water podcast and on twitter at bloody water pod but here's what's most important go get you some merch man a lot of people have been heading over to the site going copping a little something something man whether it's a mug a t-shirt we got these beautiful tri-blend t-shirts i'm not rocking anything right now but you know generally speaking i got the hoodie on i got whatever on Go copy some, bloodywaterpodcast.com, and use the code BWP10 for 10% off all merch at checkout. All right. With that being said, AJ, we got to do a little bit of matchmaking. All right, brother? So let's get into it. Um, this is going to be an easy one, man. You know what I mean? There wasn't too much of a shakeup. You could have gone a couple different ways with a couple of these fighters, but Sean Strickland. Let's just start off with him because we was talking about him, brother. Like I said, he's either one fight away from that title fight or something like that. But there's really only three ways I can go. And I just wanted you to give me the thumbs up or the thumbs down. Loser of Adesanya versus Whitaker number two. Thumbs up or thumbs down? Uh, thumbs up. Thumbs, thumbs up. up. Winner of Derek Brunson versus Cannoneer for a title eliminator match. Uh, that's where it gets a little iffy. If Brunson wins, I think so. Yes. Okay. If Brunson wins that fight, then title eliminator fight for sure. I think they both – I think Strickland deserves at least the opportunity to do that. Yeah. If Cannoneer wins, he gets a title shot regardless. Okay. So are we thumbs up or thumbs down? Or are we in the middle? Uh, it's, it's hard because it, that's depending on who it is. So I'm going thumbs in the middle. <laughs> okay, thumbs in the middle. I'll take it. Loser of Derek Brunson versus Cannoneer. Thumbs up, thumbs down. Um – yeah, yeah, I'm going thumbs up because because it depends. Like I, I don't think uh, and this is maybe a little bias of me. I don't think Brunson deserves the shot again for what is sure. it was to be the third time. Yeah, like let's let somebody else get in there, man. Let's shake it up. You know you're gonna get beat. Like maybe maybe he might not get beat. I don't know. Yeah. But um, I think if Brunson loses and then uh, Strickland fights him, I think that'd be a great fight. 
Yeah, yeah. I mean, that is the problem. When Adesanya is so dominant, you're just running through all these guys time and time again. So, yeah, a little fresh blood in there wouldn't hurt. But um, those are my three choices. And listen, we'll figure all of this out soon because guess what? They all fight next week. So <laughs> we'll find out, you know, whether wins, losses, whatever. Did you have anything different or did that pretty much line up with yours? Man, I have it like uh, I have it like in my mind, you know, if I if I was trying to set it everything up, you know, I was matchmaking yeah, and everything. Yeah. I have it set up like how the NFL playoffs work or any okay, any playoff yeah. work where like this person, if they win, this happens. If they lose, this happens. Yeah. Me personally, if Adesanya wins uh, and Brunson wins, I think Strickland gets a title shot. I think I, I think if Brunson wins and Adesanya wins. Yeah. I think Strickland gets a title shot because I okay. don't think they give it to Brunson again. Now, if Cannoneer wins, I think Cannoneer gets a title shot. Brunson sure. maybe uh, maybe fights Strickland. Maybe Strickland fights somebody we haven't seen in a while, Derek Till, which would be a fun fight. Um, I don't know if Till, Till's still having some stuff, so you yeah. know, maybe not. But either way, I think that that whole mix them up that they have going is just hard to see until we see it all shake out next week which is sure. a good thing it's next yeah. week there we go easy so stay tuned folks they only got to wait one week there we go um all right brother nick maximov man i mean he got the win he got the big time win over puna heli soriano i think a lot of people didn't expect it maximov was a betting underdog and if you took that bet on plus money like i did folks you made a little bit of cash but i i have an interesting one aj and i'll just go straight off the bat i think he needs to fight number 44 ranked Roman Delize, you know what I mean? And the reason why I say this, brother, is because he also has bombs in his hands, but he's a really, really good Greco-Roman wrestler, you know what I'm saying? Like, he's got really good takedown chops, you know? That's basically his game plan over the last last couple of fights. Instead of using the bombs, I'm just going to dominate you on the ground. So if Nick Maximov, if that's basically his game, how does fire fight against fire? We have to go to a kickboxing match, then let's see who wins. So I think that would be fun, but who do you think? Yeah, hit the nail on the head, Derek. That's the name I had, too. That's, like, in my mind, this was the slow path, but the uh, hard path, like a dangerous path. Like, we want to see against a Roman Delize and and really get up there. That's a a fight that earns you a lot of respect in the locker room, too. Absolutely, man. You see how big of a man, like, Trevin Giles was, or Trevin Giles, excuse me, when he fought. Uh, And obviously, uh, you know what I mean? He was a small 185-er in Giles. But when he fought him, I mean, it was was tough. It was was touch and go back and forth between both of them, man. So I think it would be a fun fight for Maximov because, like I said, he's only 24. Obviously, as strong as hell, the way he was able to muscle around Soriano like that. So it'll be fun, you know, using technique, all that. Um, The dark horse of the welterweight division, Shavkat Rachmanov. I want you to go first on this one, brother, because I have somebody who you might not expect. And if you do hit this one on the head, I'll be impressed. But who do you think is next for the undefeated 15-0, 100% finish rate, Shavkat Rachmanov? Man, I think they give him somebody in the top 15. Who I would like to see him fight is Jeff Neal, man. Hands of steel, Jeff Neal, the real deal. Either that or a very explosive fighter. I also had Michelle Pereira up there. Mm -hmm. But I think that he needs somebody who, in the minds of the people, is a killer. Sure. So that way he can really start to get the respect he deserves in Shavkat Rachmanov. Who are you going with? I like I like those. I think that's a little bit of a, a moving him up just a, just a touch too fast. You know what I mean? Because I thought that he should probably fight rude boy Randy Brown. I want to see how he could deal with that length, with the grappling chops of a Randy Brown. You know what I mean? Both of these dudes got real fire in their hands. Both of these dudes can submit anybody. I think that would be a very, very fun fight. But the length is the thing that speaks to me specifically. When I see how long Randy Brown is, it's like, oh, yeah, that's going to be an interesting technical fight. What do you think? Especially because uh, Shavkat is used to being the bigger man, the taller man, the longer man. Now exactly. he's on that other side of the coin. How does it fare out? Like I kind of like that one a little bit better. Although, I mean, if you're yeah. if you're Shavkat, you're taking the fast track to the top. I of think course. so. But if either he, way, that's a hard scrap. If he gets the opportunity, he has to take it. But if not, man, I don't see why not. Because Randy Brown, brother, he's as game as they come. Like you cannot discount that man whatsoever, brother. So I think that'd be fun. Uh, and yeah, easy. That was easy work right there. Brendan Allen, man. You know what I mean? This fight probably didn't do do too much for him in the in the grand scheme of things yes it's a feather in the cap you know you got to win over sam alvey but he's on a seven fight losing streak now so i mean a lot of people can say that now um listen brother i don't know where to go with brendan allen but i have one matchup potentially and it's the winner of gregory rodriguez versus armin petrosian Yes, Petrosian, excuse me. Um, And the reason why I like this fight is because I think Gregory Rodriguez would probably come out on top in this fight. Gregory Rodriguez can knock your head off of your shoulders with one punch, or he can grapple with the best of them. I was watching him at the Apex when he went to the UFC Invitational Grappling Tournament, man. And uh, I'll just say he's 
pure muscle, a scary, scary man, brother. And he, he just like, he, I think he lost one grappling match, but aside from that, he smashed everybody. It wasn't even close, man. So what do you think of that? And where can we go with Brendan Allen? Cause that was just me kind of figuring something out, but I was like, I don't know. I think he deserves more respect. Like you were saying, and he should be a lot closer to the top 15 than even what I'm giving him. But what do you think? Yeah, it's it's hard, man. Even uh, going back to the side note we were talking about, I looked at Tapology again, and they bought him down to number seventy-seven. It's crazy. Like I don't know how. Yeah, I don't know how this dude keeps losing spots. No, no respect yeah. for Brandon Allen. It's, it's fucked up. But either way, man, I think if if Brandon Allen wants that respect that that he so rightfully deserves, I think yeah. he needs to fight a very talented fighter that has the same kind of ground skills and power that leads it to there. I was thinking Robocop as well, but I went with uh, Jung Young Park, man, the oh, Iron yeah. Turtle. Yeah. I think that'd be a scrap and a very hard fight. Maybe not the most entertaining because it'll be a lot of back and forth on the ground and up and down, but yeah. I think if Brendan Allen does that in a, in a spectacular way and gets a finish against the Iron Turtle, bro, that's a, that's a, a hell of a feather in the cap right there. Absolutely, and you know what, man? I was going to pick Jung young park only reason i didn't is because he's coming off a loss that was the only reason but aside from that yes great matchup right there i love that one um all right brother brandon or brandon brian battle excuse me tough champ he solidified himself now we got to move on we forget about all the tough champ stuff that's out the rear view window he just needed to i think kind of like close the book on the on or close the book on this chapter of his of his career and now we're forgetting about tough championship. We're looking at UFC championship. That probably needs to be the goal on his mind. It's going to be a long time before he gets there, if he does get there. But in a step going towards that way, who do you who do you face him up against, man? You know what I mean? Believe it or not, uh, Andre Petrovsky is actually ranked higher than him in the topology rankings, which doesn't really make sense to me personally, um, especially because Brian Battle beat him on tough very handily. He submitted him. He finished him literally. Um, but Brian Battle, man, he still continues to get no respect. I definitely respect him now for sure. Who do you give him next? Man, this is uh this is one of those another fight where I think a lot of people underestimate Battle. They're still sleeping on him. Obviously, we're not, but I think if he goes up against a very talented, very flashy fighter, I think that'll give him more opportunity to grow in the in the casuals' mind. Because to me, the more and more I look at Tapology's rankings, I'm thinking there's some casual dudes just yeah. sitting behind, <laughs> not knowing what they're doing. No, no disrespect, but a little shade right there. Um, I'm going uh Jordan Wright, man. The Beverly Hills Ninja. That's, yep. That would be a fun fight. Just how flashy he is, and I, I don't. I don't remember if uh, Jordan Wright's coming off a loss. I think he lost one, and then he came back and won again. Um, he might be coming off a KO loss. I, I forget. But either way, it'd be a very fun, fast-paced, entertaining, flashy fight. Both people are long, super strikey. Yeah, that would be a scrap, bro. What do you think? Yeah, that's the exact one that I had. And uh, yeah, he just came off of a loss to Bruno Silva, who is a very dangerous man in the middleweight division. He uh, got knocked out in the first round. Before that, he knocked out Jamie Pickett in the first round. And before that, he uh, got knocked out by Joaquin Buckley. But other than that, basically, lives and dies by the finish. Every single fight has gone to a finish. He has never gone the distance. So that would be a very... Very, very fun fight. The exact name that I had, the Beverly Hills Ninja, is a flashy fighter and a tough karate style to deal with. So I think that would be fun too. Um, all right, AJ, lastly, Julian Arosa. He gets the win over Steven Peterson, which probably doesn't do too much for him in the grand scheme of things, to be honest. I have one name. Number 28 ranked Billy Q. Billy Quarantillo, man. I think that's the fight we have to make. And the reason why I say that is because you have a pace machine, a dude with a little bit shorter arms, a grinder, and Billy Q versus Julian Arosa, who is that uh, pace machine himself, constant volume in your face. This could easily turn into another fight of the night, in my opinion. You know what I mean? This is basically the same matchup that he just had all over again, except Billy Q, I think, is a little... He has, he has more cardio, and uh, he's willing to, uh, you know what I mean, really go out on that shield, for sure. So what do you think? I, I like that. I'm a big fan of Billy Q. Ironically, Derek, I went with the guy that just beat Billy Q. Oh, I think Shane, Burgos. the Shane Burgos yeah. fight would be a good fight to watch. I I, I forget if it's uh, up or down in the actual rankings, um, but I think that's that's kind of where I would like to see that same style of fight. You know, yeah. the, the long striking. That's really where. It, and with Burgos and or with the Rosa. He just needs a little bit bump up in the ranking. I think Shane Burgos is a perfect fight for that. What do you think? Well, I'm looking at it, and Shane Burgos is number 14th in the rankings. Billy Q is not ranked currently right now, so that is definitely a step up. Um, and I don't necessarily think Arosa should be fighting ranked guys right now, given the state of his UFC tenure, 5-5 five and five in the UFC. You know, he kind of got to earn those things. But he even said it himself in the post-fight presser. He says, I'm one of those entertaining fighters. That's what I do. That's what I've always done. I'm not here for the rankings, all that stuff. I'm here to entertain, put on good fights, win performance bonus, double bonus, and 
and get 100K plus your show money, plus your win money. Come on, brother. What are we talking about, man? So either fight would be good. I like the Billy Q route just because both dudes are unranked. And uh, it would be a grinder of a fight, man. Straight grinder of a fight. So that's the matchmaking, brother. And last thing we got to do before we get out of here is the word on the street. But before we do that, folks, make sure you share the show. Rate us five stars on Apple Podcasts and on Spotify if you're feeling inclined to do so. But most importantly, like I said, just share it with some people. Send it to your homie that likes watching fights, man. I At the jiu-jitsu tournament I was at this weekend, man, uh, one of the dudes who I competed against, man, after the match. Match, we exchanged information i was like yeah brother you know i got this show da, da, da. you like fights come tune come tune in network that's what we're talking about folks network share it over this is what we're talking about all right brother word on the street and we only got a couple of things to talk about here today but i thought these uh, were more or less important and uh let's get straight into it man so the first thing that i i teased in the beginning is that uh ultimate fighter season 30 is going to be coached by juliana pena and amanda nunez a rematch is to follow brother so uh they're already in las vegas medicals and covid testing underway filming is going to start in mid-february the season's roster has not been publicly released it has now um at this time of this article you know what i mean it, it wasn't but i the word on the street aspect of this the interesting part is not just this but it's interesting because juliana pena um she i mean was the ultimate fighter you know she won the ultimate fighter now she's coming back as the coach i mean that's pretty cool i think that's a great comeback story she's really living the dream of being the champion right now great overall what do you think of this whole entire situation Man, I'm excited because uh, I think Juliana Pena, if, you, if you've seen any interview she's done, she still feels disrespected. You know, she still feels like she has something to prove. And I think that's going to come out a lot in the show where she kind of has that little bit of animosity, which I love, man. She made it to the pinnacle of the sport. She's not resting on her laurels. She's yeah. saying, oh, yeah, y'all still, y'all still don't die. She even almost, almost got into a Joe Rogan where she was like, because you bet against me, like yeah. instantly, like <laughs> on the heat. Yeah. I love that, but I think so. It's going to be a very entertaining style. I don't know necessarily know if we'll get the shenanigans as much. You know, we might. I hope so. That'd be mm-hmm. fun to watch for the men's soap opera. But uh, <laughs> I think it'd be, it's going to be good to see the full circle come around as well as the skill level and the coaching that Amanda Nunez has for her team. Mm-hmm. I'm going to be very interested to see how that goes. Absolutely. And it's also interesting because I saw Amanda Nunez put something out about why she decided to open up a new gym. And she said she ultimately wants to lean into coaching. Like that's something that's on the horizon for her. So she wanted to open up a gym. It's not going to be a public gym. It's going to be a private gym. And she's going to be doing a little bit of coaching. So that clarifies it just a little bit more on some of the speculation that we had on why she was opening up a new gym. But either way, AJ, I, th- I think that is going to be interesting because this is just like the first fight, the buildup for it. It was like, uh, all right. Everyone thought, oh, Nunez is just going to smash. Now that we have the storyline, the narrative plus tough i mean brother they're gonna they're gonna build this thing up so crazy like this is probably gonna do some good numbers if, if i had to guess um but the next thing that we got up here aj is uh chris cyborg she blasts the lying cat zinganu for sad ped smear campaign and scott coker chines in so uh this is basically so let me just read it off cat zinganu recently used her twitter account to casually suggest that the bellator mma women's featherweight champ cyborg was running from drug testers which may or may not be retaliation for having to secure another win before scoring a featherweight title shot over there um cat zinganu why are you lying i haven't refused any drug ca- a drug test cyborg fired back via bjpen.com i'm ready whenever you are behind the scenes you keep saying to bellator you need more time to prepare for me you need a different opponent first now you go on social media with lies and smear campaigns and excuses sad um listen so scott coker he believes it's a matter of timing he says i think timing is going to be an issue on that fight when cat is ready to fight her and when we would like that fight to happen is as soon as possible that's our plan but we have to have both fighters agree to the plan so we're talking to the managers and cat's manager uh and find out whether she's ready to fight and she'd be willing to fight cyborg man so it's interesting Interesting because this is a little bit of heat over here, man. You know, in Bellator, trying to get uh, get ready for a title between these two fighters. But the big takeaway from this, brother, is that uh, I mean, listen, Cyborg is a very talented fighter. She's one of the best to do it in the game. You know what I'm saying? So to be throwing PED allegations this is a serious thing. That's not a non-serious thing for you to just be throwing around out there. What I mean, what do you make of this, brother? Do you think that this is Kat Zingani talking out of the side of her mouth, or do you think that there's real steam to this? Uh, I think it's talking, you know, talking on the side of her mouth. I actually like this, Derek. Uh, and for the reason that it's drawing, bringing, excuse me, bringing more attention to yeah. Bellator and to their fight. Sure, you know, whether there's PEDs or not, I think it's a big issue, but that's not for us to decide. Yeah. That's for us to be entertained by. And that's exactly what I think Kat Zagano is doing with this one put in the heat where it needs to be seeing how she's not necessarily in the limelight, but the, you know, the way to get somebody in the limelight is say, you know, put PD accusations. That's, that's everybody's hot button. And especially the fact that 
you know, it, it's not necessarily one of those fights. We would we would have loved to see this fight a couple years ago, you know, back when everyone is in the UFC and things were going. This would have been, a, you know, a good thing to see, but they're still maintaining it. And I think the fact that, you know, Kat Zingano's running a little bit or, or quote unquote in what everyone's saying, but the timing not working out. They want to get done as fast as possible, but both fighters aren't agreeing. I think the fact that Kat Zingano is running a little bit from the fight, she needs to throw something, a, a little wrench in the cog to say, no, 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 this isn't just me. This is her as well. I like this aspect. Throw a little bit of shade on your opponent. So that way, because they are, after all, like like Uncle Chael says, they are your partner. They, as much as might be your opponent in the cage, but for the lead up, for the promotion, they are your partner. And the more eyes you can get to that fight, the better, the better the payday, the better the numbers. I like this a lot. Even if it is lies, even if it is a smear campaign, whatever it is, I think it's a good call from Kat Zingana to at least push a little bit more out there. You know, get, 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 the, get the names out there in the spotlight. Let's, let them show what's up. I like this a lot. What do you think there? I think that's a really good perspective that you got on this one, man, because I didn't look at it from that angle. I mean, that is your job is to build up the fight, get as much hype on it as possible, rack up as much money as you can, because as much as this is the fight game, this is the entertainment game, and this is how people make a living. This is literally how they support their families, feed their families, put food on the table. Um, so it is interesting, and it sucks that it kind of has to be this way when you're like, uh, how would you say, slandering somebody or tarnishing somebody's reputation, but in the fight game, I mean, everything kind of goes, which is as unfortunate as it I mean, you're going to punch each other in the face, literally, which is interesting. Just a quick aside, when Treshawn Gore and Brian Battle were talking shit in between like rounds to each other, I was thinking to myself, I was like, why are you talking? You're literally punching each other in the face right now. Like, what are we talking about? What is there to talk about? You know what I'm saying? Either way, um, get in there, throw some hands and uh, call it a day. That's the good old way, good old fashioned way to do it, right? All right, AJ, last thing that we got on the docket here, uh, Leota Machida planning to test free agency after his next Bellator fight. Quote, the fire is still burning inside me. So he'll be a free agent the next time he leaves the Bellator bellator cage meaning that you know either bellator chose not to renew um his contract with uh, bellator or bellator you know likewise did vice versa so he only has one bout left on the contract with a promotion and he plans on testing the market later this year bellator came to us and said let's renew the contract one more time if leota wants wants to and whatever and we said no okay there you go he said let's fight this one out and we'll see the point that i wanted to take away from this aj is where could you see leota machida going if he's not in bellator there's three options right now um two options actually you have pfl or you have eagle fc if you're not in bellator those are the two premier quote unquote mma promotions that you want to go to any other mma promotion outside of eagle fc bellator and uh uh pfl right and obviously ufc is not on the table in this scenario uh any of those op anything that's not those options i feel like would be a uh, disrespect to even have them fighting in those, man. It's like you'd rather hang it up than fight in these lesser promotions that nobody's watching, nobody cares about. Where could you see Machida going? I think the the maybe not the clear path, but probably the most optimal path would be the PFL. Mm -hmm. A lot more money on the line, yeah. a little bit bigger of eyes. I honestly think he'll go to Eagle FC. I, I and and Leo is one of my favorite fighters of all time, man. The Dragon is for real, um, but it's it's rough because he's getting older and he's getting slower and things are starting to happen. So I think if he goes to Eagle FC, that'd probably be his longest way to fight you know long like time, way to stay in the fight game the longest but if he goes to the pfl it's a way to make the most money so i don't know man i i'm i'm leaning a little bit more towards i can see eagle fc happening but at the same point i'd like to see him cash a milli so yeah yeah i mean either one would be good options i i think i'd prefer pfl just a little bit more to be honest you know what i mean because we don't have the same track record track record excuse me with eagle fc as we do with pfl we know pfl is throwing that money in we know that they put on good fights we know that they got the deal with espn all that more eyes will be on machida i think that's the way to go but uh it's just you know it's sad because this is a dude who has been a professional since 2003 and what does the article say karate specialist has defeated a long list of legends in the sport including gaygard musashi Randy Couture, Dan Henderson, Ryan Bader, Shogun Hua, Rashad Evans, Tito Ortiz, BJ Penn, Stefan Bonner. Like, come on, brother. Everybody. Like, the dude has beat everybody. You remember when he knocked out Rashad Evans to win the title, man. Like, that's just, like, seared in my mind. Rashad Evans one of my favorites to do it ever. So it's just like, you know, Machida... One of the best. Wish him all the luck. I hope he makes a lot of money. That's really what I hope for more than anything. Just make a ridiculous amount of money, brother. You deserve it. Because you know in the early days of the UFC, they wasn't they wasn't pumping out money like that. All right, AJ. That is the word on the street. This is the outro. And folks, you can see if you are watching in the bottom left-hand corner of your screen, that is the poster for next week's fight. 
Israel Adesanya versus Robert Whitaker number two brother and I'll tell you I'm as conflicted as ever for this fight you definitely got to give the edge to Izzy just because he's on he's steamrolling everybody man he's a different caliber of fighter but something that I told you for a long time is after Whitaker lost the title it's like people forgot that he was the champion like people forgot that the man was the best in the world to do it We'll talk about it next week, folks. So tune in with us, man. Mondays and Fridays, 8 a.m. Short clips drop on our YouTube channel at noon, Mondays and on Fridays. And uh, as always, man, you can just head over to the Bloody Water Podcast uh, website, which is bloodywaterpodcast.com, and you can get everything that you need to know. Hit us up on Instagram, Bloody Water Podcast, on Twitter at Bloody Water Pod. And uh, AJ, brother, you got any last words for the people before we get out of here? Man. Yeah, man. I, I mean, folks, Derek said it best. Just share it out. So th yeah. That's the biggest thing that helps us the most. But also pay attention to these sleepers, man. We do all this work for a reason. Both sleepers this week were absolute fire fights. A lot of fun to watch. There's a lot of new people that we got our eyes on. So if you want to make that money, you want to see a little bit of growth in the sport, you can. You got friends who just kind of talk about it, you know, let them know. Share, the, share it out. It helps us a ton. And we appreciate all the love out here. Thank you again. It's been a fun one. And this, this next week, man, it's going to be some fire for these fights. Absolutely. Absolutely. So back again with another pay-per-view next time, folks. And uh, AJ said it beautifully, man. I can't say it any better myself. So I'm just going to leave it there, folks. Until next time. Peace.